You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Men saying, like, I fucking graph for 80 hours a week and I can't find it for them. But, and I really do feel for them. Like, yeah, you do graft all week, and, but don't hate the player, hate the game. You guys created this kind of industry. You the one to put us... You're sexual- the one funding it. Yeah, you are the ones who are obviously paying for it. Or you sexualising us. You are the... Nobody ever whinges about going on Pornhub or RedTube or whatever for free. They don't whinge about that. They only whinge when they start or have to pay for it. I'm not fucking giving that slag 20 quid, but they'll go on Pornhub for a free wank. How am I a slag for making money, but they're not a slag, or you're not a bad person for... It, don't, like, point your finger with one hand and wank with the other, basically, is what I'm trying <laughs> to say. I've never said I was the prettiest or the best body. I just was the right one to do it at the right time, and I've always said this. So people could were confused, like, why is this bang average looking girl getting all this attention so people start to really like hate on me and stuff so if you search like i've done a youtube video about this actually saying like about the trolls back then like if you search my name like chelsea ferguson slag chelsea ferguson kill yourself there's hundreds of tweets like saying i'm fucking sick of the sight of this slag chelsea ferguson uh go and kill yourself and blah 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 like just really fucking horrible I've done a video and oh my god it went crazy i think i made like 40 grand in that first week on my own page like as a model the site made like i can't remember what the figures were for the first couple of weeks but we turned over a million in the first three months so that's how wild it went well i haven't had a healthy mindset for six years obviously i've battled with you drink and partying and things and yeah obviously now i'm just trying to make a change for my son's sake basically like just that i'd like to stop drinking and just need to like yeah just do better basically which has been it's been really hard for the past six years like i never had anyone to answer to when i didn't have my baby and i just went from bad relationship to bad relationship i guess i'll i because people told me what i wasn't worth anything for so long that I just started believing it and get, going out with people that didn't show me any worth, basically. When your son gets older as well, how does that play a, a pe- a effect on your mind of the videos that's out there, the pictures and stuff? Oh, God, I was... I've been... I can't even talk about it. I've been suicidal quite a few times. I actually, like, was in hospital once from taking an overdose. But, yeah, like... It is really hard to like. Boom, we're on. Boom, we're on. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Chelsea Ferguson. How are you, Chelsea? Good, how are you? Good to see you, babe. <laughs> Nervous? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Everybody always feels the same. First of all, beautiful gaff. You've moved into your new house. Thank you. I haven't got an iron. I haven't got an so, iron. Yeah. <laughs> I have someone who does my washing and ironing. Big time now. <laughs> no, it's just my friend actually, but she just started, took it upon herself to start doing my ironing. Like I just said, I don't iron anything. Everything I buy doesn't need ironing. And then she just started saying, give me that, I'll iron it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it must have felt sorry for me. <laughs> You've got a very fascinating story, kind of rags to riches from... Flipping, flipping burgers at McDonald's to then turning over a £20 million pound business, which is phenomenal. So take my hat off to you, babe. Thanks. How's life just now? It's good. Like, I've got my baby. He's like six months old and just obviously just moved to my new house, um, which is, if anyone follows me, uh, obviously like a nice big house with like its own private grounds and everything. It's everything anyone would dream of, really. So I'm happy about that. And yeah, business as well, going well. Um not much new to report apart from that. Yeah, we'll get into everything anyway, but I always <laughs> like, like to go back to the start with my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. So I was actually born, not many people know this, but I was actually born in St Albans in Hertfordshire. But my mum and dad are both from Hartlepool. And then um, I was raised here. Um, I came back up here when I was about two or something. So I started nursery and school and everything up here. Um, yeah, I just went to a normal school. Um, we never had much money. We weren't skint, but we we weren't like rich or anything. My mum and dad just worked and stuff. My dad's a prison officer. Well, he was, um, and me mum was a uh, well. She just worked in shops and stuff. Me mum, 
Um, yeah, and that was it really. What were you like at school? Uh, probably depends who you ask. I, I know what my memory's so bad, but I, I think I was always in trouble a little. Like when I was younger, I think I was just a bit of a gobshite. Um, I can see that. <laughs> like, what's that thing people say? Like, well behaved women rarely make history. Yeah. That's like me basically. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't like, I was clever. Um, but they used to say she's really clever but she doesn't apply herself I was distracted easily I was more interested in boys and having a laugh and going out and stuff like that rather than school I'm better at like hands on type of things rather than um, like academic I get bored if I'm not interested I'm bored quite easily um, so just I just never had much interest like, things like PE I got an A at GCSE food technology I got an A like things where I'm like you know physically doing something um, I was better at that kind of stuff rather than books and stuff like that. So. You ever in trouble? Yeah, I got suspended a couple of times for fighting. Once I took a knife to school, I got kicked out. I was, like, which sounds awful now, and I'm like, what the hell? I was only 14. And I think even at the time, I thought, like, I'm not going to actually stab someone with it. Like, I didn't, in my head, I was like, I don't, I didn't think it was as bad as I would think now. Bloody hell, like, knife crime stuff. That wasn't even really a thing when I was that age. So, like... I don't know, no one ever like talked about it. It was just because some lass was bullying me. I thought I'm gonna take this knife and scare her off with it. That was the reason behind it at the time. But yeah, I got suspended from school for that one. I got suspended for fighting a couple of times, but it was always somebody else, but it was always me being a gobshite that led to it. So I'm not a, I'm not a victim, but I'm definitely not like, you know what I mean? I was just not a bully, but I was in the middle somewhere. How did that affect you being bullied? Um. I don't know, like, I think it just made me, like, I used to come home crying from school a lot. Um, and then my mum would be up at the school, like, saying something needs to be done about this. But I think the way I was bullied at school, it was more, like, sly bullying, like, bitchy bullying. Never, like, the fights I got into were never with the people who I would say bullied me. It was just always random. But the, um, the people that bullied me were, like, my so-called friends at the time. They used to just, like, you know, like, wind me up and stuff like that. And I used to go home crying, like, they all just chew me all the time. But, like, the way I remember it now, I'm like, did it even happen like that? Was I, was I like, you know, I'm, I'm, like, confused as to, like, whether it was me or not. Because, you know, as you grow up, you think, it'll probably be me. That Like, you know what I mean? I was probably remember it a different way. But I just remember always coming home crying. My mum always going up to school saying, the better leave her alone and stuff like that. But, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes it can make you tougher as well. It makes you rebel against everyone, and that's where you get. Fuck it, I'm taking a knife into school. Yeah, I don't basically. want to be harmed again or hurt because we're all, we all, we all hate pain, don't we? So, when you after school, then what was life like then? So I left school, went to um, went to college and done A levels. Um, then I went to uni. I done one year at uni. I was doing um, performing arts. I just wanted to go to Hartlepool. Um, so I done performing arts, but. Then I started like dancing while I was in Sheffield because I moved to Sheffield. Um, I'd never even seen a strip club before. Like I'm from Hartlepool, there's no, well, there isn't one now, but years ago, I didn't know one stripper. It was very underground, very, you nobody admits to being a stripper kind of thing. Um, so I went in a strip club one night with the lads at uni and I was just in awe of it. I was like, oh my God, they looked like so glamorous and like, it was just, it was a big American Spearmint Rhino. So like, not like some of these little shit strip clubs, big American 16 foot pole, like huge stage. It was like a proper performance when they went on the pole. And I was just drawn in straight away. I was like, fuck uni, I'm going to be a stripper. <laughs> at what age? I was maybe 19 at the time. And did you ever think of that stuff prior? Nah, I didn't even know about it. Like I literally never even knew anyone who was a stripper, never heard of anyone who was a stripper. Like I said, I, I moved down there and it was just like opened my eyes to like, what, this is like a thing. Like obviously I'd heard of strip clubs and movies and films and stuff like that, but you just didn't really think it was like real people that did it in like real life, do you know what I mean, at this point. So I was like, wow, well, what do you have to do to get a job here? Like, so I just straight away like emailed them when I got back and I was like, is any jobs gone? And then I come for an audition and the rest is history really. What was it like going in for your first night? Oh, I was like proper nervous because I mean, when I was younger, I was like promiscuous, shall we say. <laughs> like I was always got attention off lads and like loved the attention and stuff. I wasn't like, I think I thought I was like good looking or whatever when I was like a kid. When I look back at them pictures now, I'm like, as if you thought you looked all right then. But to be fair, nobody had like lip fillers on their ears or extensions or out like that really. Everyone was just what they were back then. 
Um, and yeah, and I just I got the interview, went down, and uh, the clip, strip club manager was like, oh, like you basically have to get naked in the audition just to like prove that you will do it. Later found out that he was just having me life, bro. I did it. He, like he don't, nobody else ever had to do that. He was just seeing if he could do because he knew I was like basically a sweet innocent girl who'd come from another town and I didn't know anything about strip clubs or anything. He was just like, oh yeah, you've got to get naked so that I, I know that on the night you're not gonna like bottle it. So I was like taking me top off like felt like proper abused or something Lily later ended up being my friend and stuff but at the time I was like this normal like just and then I, and then he's like right you have to turn around and all that I was like <laughs> it just felt really awkward but um yeah I ended up getting obviously every, anyone who goes to an audition pretty much gets the job um and then yeah just started working there bless me bless I'll you hay fever. So I offered you a tablet you said no no um so you are very popular doing the stripping. You've done UK tours. Why did you become popular doing it compared to the other girls who there's so many different strip clubs, but you were quite at the forefront? It wasn't the strip clubs that made me popular. It was the internet. So round about a few years after I started dancing, I was at the top of my game in the clubs that I worked in, but like nobody knew me outside of the clubs or out. Like I was on, I was one of the top earners pretty much like every night. And then... um Twitter come about. I can't remember what year Twitter was out, but it started to get popular around, I think, 2011, maybe, 2012. Then I got on there, nobody I knew was even on it. Everyone was like, I don't get it. Like, it was quite confusing at first. Everyone's like, so what? You just write things on it and send it. Like, it was a bit of a... Like, everyone had maybe his MySpace and stuff then. And then, I don't even know if Facebook was really a thing. Anyway, so I got on Twitter and I was like, I'm going to try and get on this, like, get, like big on it kind of thing so I was like oh you get followers um so I tweeted saying if I get to a thousand followers I'll put a picture of my tits on so I obviously I had a boob job at this point and um it just kind of like snowballed straight away so people were going like back then no normal girls got their tits out on the internet it was either you're a porn star you were nuts zoo FHM or that was it. Like, you were an underground stripper no one talked about. There was no online, no, you know, selling your nudes online. There was none of that. So I was on um, Twitter and I said, right, I'll tweet it. Didn't think anyone was listening to me if I had about 100 followers, maybe. So I said, if everyone retweets this and we get like, um, like if I get a thousand followers, I'll put a picture of my tits on. So everyone was tagging their friends. This, this girl's going to put her tits on the internet. It was like an unheard of thing. Anyway, I got a thousand followers like really, really quick. So as I, as I said, I got my tits on there. <laughs> there were canny tits, to be fair. <laughs> I've had a baby now. <laughs> but um, if you Google me tits, you'll find them. <laughs> I'm sure there's probably perverts watching this and we're doing it. Living They've under a rock. seen them probably. You're living under a rock if you haven't seen my tits. <laughs> um, so yeah, like put my tits on. Well, it went crazy because there were obviously really good tits as well, if I do say so myself. Everyone was retweeting it. Everyone was going, mate, seeing this girl's tits, like tagging each other. So then... Everybody, so then I got like 2,000 followers and then like 5,000 followers. And in the space of, I can't remember the time scale now because my memory's shocking. A couple of months in, I was taught, you were talking like say 100,000 followers, which now loads of people have got that many followers. But then nobody did. I was like the original, like famous online kind of thing. Like I didn't know anybody else who had this kind of presence online. Um, just for being online, you know what I mean? Rather than having like obviously TV work or anything. So then obviously this, um, I started to get like the magazines messaging me and stuff like, like like nuts and zoo they used to do like nuts magic monday was like a thing if anyone remembers that far back so then they used to like retweet like normal girls onto their timeline and stuff like that and then yeah i just started to like get followers from that and and then like other girls started doing it so some of the other girls i still taught it with this day um softer for uh sasha mcgee like they are still in this industry with me now because they were there at the beginning the ogs like we were the the original girls who did this thing um so yeah i started getting the interest started getting the followers and then i went up to like seven hundred and fifty thousand followers on twitter i've only got about five hundred thousand now because i dropped loads of them dropped off and stuff um but yeah, I was just, then I got to the point where I was like, right, what can I do? So I started posting loads of different pictures of my tits, my ass, my body. Um, and then I was like, need to do something different. Everyone's sick of seeing the same thing. So I started doing tits on tour. So anywhere I went, I was doing like tits and Nando's, tits and TGI's, tits and Wagamama's. Every restaurant I went in, getting a picture of my tits out, basically on the slide. Like none of the staff would ever see. I'll be like, right, take the picture now. And um you'll probably still find them now if you hashtag like tits on tour. There'll be loads of pictures of me tits in random places. Um, 
and everyone was just obsessed. Like everyone was like, I can't believe this normal girl just going these random places and getting her tits out. So then it was like people's mission to get me to their place. So then they started inviting me to like club nights, doing PAs. And I was like, obviously with the only other people doing stuff like that at the time was the Geordie Shaw. That was round about the time they started. So we're talking 10 years ago. Um, like they, Gaz and all them were doing like club appearances. And then people started paying me to go. I was getting a thousand pound to go to a club to like get me tits out and get me photo took of people. People were queuing up to get a photo of me. I was like, I'm not famous. I'm just known on the internet. But at the same time I was doing the strip club. So then people started making their trips, like their stag dudes to come and visit me. So then I had a queue of people in the strip club. Like you couldn't get a dance with me. If you come later on, there was a queue. Like you couldn't, like it's just being unheard of for a stripper to get that that popular. Do How you know much what I mean? for that dance? Uh, it was 20 quid a dance. But then as I started to get like more, like, Busy, I'd start a charge for it. You could have done. Oh, sick, man. Strip <laughs> joints, we used to go back in the day, it was a tenner. Yeah, you wouldn't get it on me for a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> How was that then getting that attention? Is that become scary? It did because with with the um with the love come like a lot of hate, especially from like girls at the time, because I've never said I was the prettiest or the best body. I just was the right one to do it at the right time. And I've always said this. So people could, were confused, like, why is this bang average looking girl getting all this attention? So people started to really like hate on me and stuff. So if you search, like I've done a YouTube video about this actually, saying like about the trolls back then. Like if you search my name, like Chelsea Ferguson slag, Chelsea Ferguson kill yourself, there's hundreds of tweets like saying, I'm fucking sick of the sight of this slag Chelsea Ferguson, uh, go and kill yourself and blah, blah, blah. Like just really fucking horrible. Like I was only just a, a young lass at the time having a laugh. Like at that point, it was ne I never wasn't, wasn't really making the money. Well, I was in the strip club and stuff, but I wasn't making any money online through it. Um, I was just literally doing it for the crack. Like, and then it started to turn into, oh, I can make money from this. Like that was never my intention at the beginning. Um, it was just to have a bit of fun and like I thought it was funny and then the attention was funny and I enjoyed that. But yeah, it was just, I got, I got a lot of hate to start with and there's still like hundreds or thousands probably of tweets like slagging me off. Back How then. does your mum and dad take to that from the young girl who went to uni to then getting the tits out all over social media? How does that affect me? My mum used to take me pictures. <laughs> like she was not asking the slightest. My dad's dead laid back, doesn't give a fuck really. Um, well, like he just, he just, you know, he's just like, oh yeah, it's funny. Like, but my mum was like, my number one fan really. Um, I used to ask her to take photos. Oh, sorry, I'm getting really worried. That's okay, man. Um, so yeah, she used to like take me photos for me if I if I asked her to and stuff. And she obviously loved the money really. Like I used to look after her and stuff like that. So we'll touch on that now. Your mum got diagnosed with cancer and passed away. It was a big part of your life, which you still struggle with now. Is it six years? Yes, later? six years. Yeah. And how um, was that going through that experience? It's the worst time of my life and it just never really goes away. Like, she was my best friend, my biggest supporter, my number one fan. When I started to get in the magazines and stuff like Zoo and Nuts and all that, she used to work in Tesco. So anytime anyone bought it, she'd be like, that's my daughter on page, whatever. And like, you know, like just loved it. Like cause people used to be horrible, like and say, um, no, but your parents are so proud. I'm like, look, there's worse things on the planet than getting your fucking tits out, like, away, like, not hurting anyone, like, enjoying myself. Like, you're born naked, like, you know, it's not a big deal. I don't know why people make such a big fucking deal about whether you want to get naked or not. Like, I, I still, you're not hurting anybody. Like, I don't know what the problem is. Like, so, yeah, I used to get that a lot. Like, your mum's so proud of you. And I'm like... My mum wouldn't have been able to live if it wasn't for me in the end. Like, you know, she got, she was really poorly. She couldn't work. She didn't get diagnosed for like nine months, so she couldn't work. Who do you think was paying her mortgage and her bills? And I took her on the three holidays when we, after we, she got diagnosed and the told us it was terminal. We went on a big family holiday, like 16 of us to Florida, um, 16 of us to Greece or Cyprus, Cyprus it was. Um, and I took her, where else did she go? Went on th she went on three old days before she passed, um, which obviously she got them memories, like, well, we got them memories before she left. So it wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for the industry and the money I made. But she, I know she was proud of me, like, she told me, like, every day. Yeah, but you don't need to justify your yourself to anyone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, nobody knows what you're living with. 
yourself or your family. Like people are always going to make assumptions. People are always going to judge. This is a, the, the power of social media. Everyone has an opinion. Yeah. When your mum passed away, what was your life like? What were you doing with your life then? Were you still stripping? Were you still doing yeah, all I was, your other um, stuff? Yeah, I was still dancing when um, when she got pool leaked. So I was working down in... I worked. I start, started in Sheffield, then I went to Manchester, then I come back to Sheffield, then I went to Leeds. Then I ended up coming home when she got diagnosed. I started working up in Newcastle. Um, just to be closer to home, really. I moved back in with her. Um, and yeah, just dancing still. And then um, after she passed, yeah, I was still dancing for a while. How was that to be dancing while your mum was only had a few weeks to go? I was back in the strip club pretty much straight away, which people probably thought was really weird because I had to just get on with it. Like I had to just, if I'd have sat in the house and moped about, like it would have been 50 times worse for me. I had to keep busy. So I went back to the strip club straight away, obviously drinking and just masking everything, trying to like, just trying to cope really. Yeah, that's a difficult thing. You, you never cope. You never. It's hard to accept. Now this is six years later. I'm still not coping yeah, now. Of course, <laughs> but you are coping, man. We'll touch on the stuff that you're trying to do now to try and face everything head on. Now I always say this in every podcast, but everybody battles, man. Like no matter how big your house is, what, how much money you're making, your prime example that more money, more problems. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But if you've got a healthy mindset, then. That's the most... Well, I haven't had a healthy mindset for six years. Obviously, I've battled with you drink and partying and things. And, yeah, obviously now I'm just trying to make a change for my son's sake, basically. Like, just started, like, to stop drinking and just need to, like, yeah, just do better, basically. Which has been... It's been really hard for the past six years. Like, I never had anyone to answer to when I didn't have my baby. And I just went from bad relationship to bad relationship. I guess I, I, cause people told me what I wasn't worth anything for so long that I just started believing it and get, going out with people that didn't show me any worth, basically. So just, yeah, like in a vicious circle of... But now I know that I'm worth more and I've got my baby and I just want to do it for him, like, just be a better person, really. But you're only 31... So this is, a, this is a great old bastard. <laughs> but this is a great time to start making changes in your life between the ages of 27, 35, like people start. Yeah. I always, you question, you've got to question everything, but when you've no responsibilities, if you've lived a life of alcohol, drugs, not really caring, if you don't value yourself, then it's hard for anybody else to see value in you also. I just attract fucking idiots because I was one. But like attracts like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, I'm, I'm not under no illusion that I'm some kind of victim and that, but I know I was, I've been bad in the past. I've been the toxic one. I've been, you know, I've been awful as well. Like, but I've been with people who made, brought out me worst, I guess. So being in like particularly bad, abusive relationships and I literally ran away from one. Like I, I went with the clothes on me back and like, you know, I was homeless. Well, not prop, like proper homeless because I did own a house, but it was rented out. So I was like... I mean, people are laughing like, oh yeah, totally homes. But I actually had nowhere to go because I was living with the boyfriend at the time. But he was so abusive and stuff. So I ran away and luckily my gay friend put me up in his house for a few months till I could like get my tenant out and stuff. But I'd sold all my furniture. So I had to start again from square on really. Like basically getting all furniture again. Like starting, I had not a penny in my pocket when I ran away from him because he controlled the full money, everything. And from, that was only maybe four year ago. So from four years ago and having not a penny in my pocket and running away with nothing to where I am now, like I'm really like proud of where like where I am. You should be proud. You should be proud. How is that though, to be a stripper, to be online, getting your tits out? How does that well, how does that does that how does that affect a relationship? Have you ever had anyone that has accepted that? Yeah, so like they would always be alright with it at the beginning because there's a novelty there, like I'm with Chelsea Ferguson, like everyone buzzes off her online, blah blah blah. But then once they realise, they go from the Sedgy Fergo or the Chelsea Fergo that everyone knows online, the Chelsea that you're left with is probably not as exciting as you think. <laughs> so once it comes down to like normal life together and I'm just like this boring, as I would say, just boring normal person, then it's like, oh, the novelties wore off now. I don't want you stripping anymore and stuff like that. And I'm like, 
he would got with me knowing that I did that. And it was never like, there was never, never happy so from relationship relationship. I like would end up splitting up. I've never had a relationship longer than a year and a half in my whole life. <laughs> <At> 32. <laughs> it's a year and a half longer than mine anyway. That was it, so don't worry about it. Um, what Charles wore? Two minutes? Yeah, but 30 year, seconds? A year. <laughs> a year. But it's the same. But then again, there was so many fights in between. Yeah, but I literally give it up, give it all up for one person, the one who ended up being like the abusive one. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna give this a real go, give up everything, you know, get a normal job. See, so I had businesses, so I started working for him, like doing, I'd done like makeup, I did um, hair, uh, tattoo removal, I did, um, I worked in the shop on reception, he had a tattoo shop and stuff. So I, I really give it a go that time. That was the first time I'd give it a go. And then it turned out to be like, you know, abusive and, and stuff like that, controlling, even though I was not even doing anything. Like, I was literally, like, never allowed to go anywhere or do anything. So, yeah, that turned out bad, and that's when I ran away, and that was after I'd give up everything. So I didn't have a penny left. I did that for him, like, give it up. Then I had nothing left, and when I left him, it was, like, starting all over again because for a year and a half, that was my longest relationship. I'd give up being Chelsea Ferguson, so drop loads of followers. No one was interested in me anymore. You've got to keep, you know what it's like online. You've got to keep people, you've got to keep on it all the time. But you're interested in doing different things. I'd lost a lot of my fans. Like, they were like, oh, she's engaged. She's off. Like, let's forget about that kind of thing. So I nearly lost everything for him. But luckily, I still had some follow. Well, I still had 500,000 followers. But Twitter, it started like shadow banning and things like that. So even when I was tweeting to 500,000 people, nowhere near that was seeing it. Um, so I started like, basically started all over again at that point. What age were you? Uh, this was about four or five years ago. So what am I now? 32. So, so still fairly recent. Like yeah, not not that long. How was it making that transition from being a stripper to then try to... Normal life. Yeah. Did it, it feel okay? It didn't feel as hard because he had money. Like, if I'd have been given it all up for somebody who didn't have money, then it would have been, like, really hard because it, it, you're used to a certain lifestyle. You're used to be able to just go, oh, I'm going here, I'm going there. But that turned out to be, him having money turned out to be the bad thing because then he would control me with it. And I couldn't have my own, like, didn't have my own. And I'd never had, nor had my own. I'd always had my own money. So it was hard to go from having me own money and buying whatever I wanted whenever I wanted to asking somebody can I have 15 quid to go and get me hair curled like it's not nice to have to ask somebody for for basic necessities but that's how it ended up and that's why I just couldn't I resented him for I resented him for me giving up my career and then that would be like the clash you know for taking I, away your freedom basically yeah yeah because oh. we live I lived 40 minutes away from my friends and family was never allowed to come and sleep down here with like my friends even though they were gay like I wasn't allowed to sleep over at their house he wanted me home and like it was just all very like toxic and he'd set stuff on fire like I'd smash stuff of his because he'd done stuff to mine and it was just sorry just whacked the mic it was like every night like I was packing me shit nearly every every other day a minute to leave him and it was just a big fucking mess but you live and learn you do and I would never ever and I've got a tattoo with his stupid name on <laughs> for the rest of my life um, that went down well so yeah you just do you do, and I, will, I won't regret going for that relationship because it made me realise what I would never ever fucking put up with ever again and I'll never ever let a man like do that on me again like I, I say the warning signs and the red flags before now like before mm -hmm. so when you started doing all that coming out of that relationship is that when you started putting the wheels in uh, motion to go forward and create your own business where did the idea come from to create this business so I now? ran away and went straight back dancing because I just needed some money like quickly so I went straight back dancing the only, one of the only things I grabbed out of his house when I left was my stripper shoes I was like grab me stripper shoes I was like fucking need these straight away because you can't get good stripper shoes um, so I grabbed them and I, I was like I, that was the only thing that I needed I thought I'll make like I'll be fine with them went back dancing straight away and then I met my friend Dee Scottish actually from Glasgow yes. one of the Glasgow and um and, she, and she, we, that I met her like in the strip club. I'd never met her before. And obviously I was broken at this point. Like I was literally like, oh, I was so skinny. I wish I could be that skinny again. <laughs> I don't want to go through the shit though. But um, you know, I was just so skinny. I was withdrawn. Like I was living out my friend's spare room. Like it was a bit shit. And she was like, oh, I'm on this website. Like where you like sell nudes and stuff like that. And I thought, well, I've already had my tits all over the internet. I may as well like do it basically. So she set me up on there. And I obviously like still had some of my followers and stuff. So I tweeted saying like, all right, I'm on this site. And um, I made like a grand a day for the first like week or something. I was like, surely not. Like surely I, this will not stay. Like this kind of money will not stay there. 
So it just started like coming in thick and fast, like loads of money. And I was like, what the fuck? So I like, I, like quickly like organized, like go and see an accountant and things like that. Cause I was like, I don't know what to do with like this kind of money going like in my bank and stuff. Pardon. So then, yeah. So then um, it just went crazy. And then after like a year or something, I'd made like $500,000 on there. But they took 20%, so that was like 100,000. Uh, but they were ripping me off as well. They weren't putting, they, were, they have like this little way to like click money out yeah, because it was an English company, but the page in dollars. So in the exchange rate, they used to take like big chunks off you and you, no one was ever questioning it. You are just like, oh, it must be the exchange rate. But when we looked into it properly, they'd actually been stealing like thousands and thousands of people. Um, so at that point, and the site was really, really slow, and I was like, I can't cope with this site anymore. Like, I've given them $100,000, and it's slow as fuck. Like, it was really pissing me off. So I thought, I'm just going to make my own. Like, I'm just going to make my own site. So went to see a web developer, um, and he was just like, there was this one guy I met, and he was like, we didn't realise how big it was going to be. So he was quoted as, like, 12 grand for the website. And I was like, bloody hell, it's a lot of money, 12 grand. Anyway... The website ended up cost me forty five, um, because we ended up going to a, we had to go to a whole team of account um, of web developers because it was going to be so big. So we had it and we decided because at first I was like, oh, I'll just do like ChelseaFerguson dot com or whatever and get people to come and just sign up to me. But then I thought I may as well do it and get some of my mates on because Dee and a few other girls like Soft Defoe, I said before, like girls I knew from years ago were doing this kind of thing. So I was like. There was, they were all sick of it. They were just sick of the site. They were sick of how slow it was and they were sick of how much money they were getting took off them. So I said, right, I'll make my own and other girls can come on it. So we took us about, I think it was about seven months to make the site. Um, and yeah, we went live. I got all my friends on there um, and it just went crazy. So I'd never done, I'd only ever done like topless or done fully nude on the other one. But I was like, I need to do something that's really going to make people come on the, our site because if it's just the same thing then no everyone's gonna go and no, I'll just stay on this one so I was like right I'll do my first porno <laughs> didn't really want to do it like but I was like I'm gonna take one for the team because this <laughs> this is gonna be make or break for our site and I'd spent this 45 grand on it so I thought I'm gonna have to do something that makes them go fucking hell she's doing this well let's go and have a look so I did I done like I had a boyfriend at the time it was me and him at the time and um, made uh whatever um Porno. I'm trying not to talk to him. My dad's out there. <laughs> he knows, but like, doesn't have to hear it, does he? So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like, done a video, and oh my god, it went crazy. I think I made like forty grand in that first week on my own page, like as a model. The site made like I can't remember what the figures were for the first couple of weeks, but we turned over a million in the first three months. So that's how wild it went. Like crazy. Like you know, two. There was me and my cousin Becky. Two women never had a business plan, never had, never done anything like this before. She's really good. Like Becky's the back end of everything. She's like the site would be nothing without her. I'm the one who had the followers and the, took one for the team in the porno. But if it wasn't for Becky, like it would be nothing. Do you know what I mean? So we, we work. We say with the dream team because I'm the face and the um and the tits of the business, and she's the everything behind the scenes. Um, and she was the one who was meeting with the web developers. I mean, I was going as well, but. That, I'm just not really like, I just, like I said before, I'm a struggle to stay interested in things when it starts to get technical and stuff like that. I'm just a bit like, get confused. So she's so good at stuff like that. So she was in charge of everything. She's like the real CEO. And I'm just like, basically like a silent partner. Now I'm like, I, I do my own page and stuff, but I don't really get involved in the back end of stuff. So... Yeah, oh, but sure. is that then trying to get that content? How much pressure? Look, for myself, I'm always trying to get guests to create stories, to hit bigger views, to hit bigger... It becomes yeah. a stress to be successful. It, it's, yeah. it's a constant stress. Because it's so much competition yeah, as well, course. isn't so it? Yeah. How hard is that and how draining does that become in your life to then making pornos to then... Yeah. It all becomes basically empty sex to then make money. Well, the thing is, I I, I haven't I haven't done any like videos since I was obviously with me ex who was my baby's dad I haven't done anything since then um which has been about four or five months I've done like pictures just myself and stuff but I'm not gonna go and I just don't like sleeping with people right? people will find that hard to believe but I don't like sleeping with people for nothing um so I haven't actually since I split up with him but um the only people I've made videos with was partners at the time so like people I've actually been in a relationship with the only people I've made like videos with um just because I wouldn't be comfortable like doing it with like a random person or anything so 
I haven't done anything on my page. I still get people, I'm not making it as much as I was because obviously I'm not doing fresh stuff all the time, but I still get, because I've still got like a few thousand pieces of content on there with videos and stuff from ages ago. So like people can still go on and see that kind of stuff. So I still get the sign ups and stuff. How many times do I say stuff? <laughs> How does that affect you mentally? Like, I know so many strippers, porn stars who are the, the most soundest people ever they're loyal as fuck and they would any time if ever needed anything they would have been there yeah but i still see sadness as well i was going through a time when i was sad doing all the shit that i'd done but how do you see people in that industry it's you know what like it's because you get such a bad rep like you literally could be the nicest person ever like i've done loads for charity and stuff like that and it's still you still get like the backhanded compliments from it like i, do, I raised 10 grand for the food bank in during covid in hartleypool and i still got people going oh she's only doing it for likes or she's she's got more money than that is that all she give 10 grand and it's like i'm got as much money as people think like i made good money but like i've invested it back in, in my company on my houses like i i haven't just got loads of money in the bank like I fucking wish I did and I would do even more like and I want to go back and do more stuff when I have got more money in the future and help other people but that's like long-term things that I want to do because I've got my dream house now like once I've settled into that little life I want to do things for like my local town or community or like that's things I want to do in the future but you do you just get you just get slagged off something rotten even if you were out sleeping with people every single week I've got friends who have sex for money like, you're not hurting anyone as long as you're, you're being safe and happy. Like, I just don't understand what it's got to do with anyone else. Like, I've never been an escort. I've never had sex with money. Like, that's just my choice because I'm boring cow, basically. And I just don't, don't like sleeping people. So I haven't done that. But if I had done, like, it, it doesn't make you a bad person. Like, I've got friends that do that. Like, as long as they're happy within themselves, I just don't see what it's got to do with anyone else. But you, there's girls who go out every weekend and shag different men for a line of coke. And you know what they do. Like, people who have normal jobs, teachers, like, you know, nurses. It doesn't make you a bad person. Do do what you got to do. Yeah, I always say that, as long as you're not hurting anyone. Yeah. But you come across very bold on social media as if you don't care, this and that. But then you've never actually had sex with someone sober. Um... I probably have in relationships, but no, I would never dream of having sex with someone so bad. It's very weird. But Why is that? I don't know. I've just got to like, I've just never really felt confident enough to have sex sober. I just, I don't know. It sounds weird, doesn't it? I have, I have in a relationship probably a few times, but even if you probably speak to any of my exes, they'll tell you the truth. I'm def definitely not a sexual person. Like, obviously my whole business and life is based on that and I'm just robbed a living basically. I say it all the time. Um, it's definitely not part of me be to be sexy, like at all. Um, I have proper struggle with it. It's like a persona that I created and that's why I was always drunk, like in the strip club, I was drunk, good at my job when I was drunk. Um, but sober, no, not sexy. <laughs> Is that tell, not tell you something, though, that you have to mask it for what you're doing in life that's not really fulfilling you? Probably, yeah. But um, I feel like I can't even say I didn't enjoy it because I feel like I look back on the stripper years and they were the best years of my life. Like, I felt like, at the time, I really enjoyed them. Like, I loved going to work. I loved meeting people. I loved getting pissed. I'm going to laugh. Like... I loved the job, like, I really genuinely think that I did, but, like, then you always make me question, go, well, if you loved it that much, why did you have to be pissed? I don't know, like, I honestly can't answer that question. But then I guess, does anybody genuinely, not many people can say that they go to work every day and absolutely love their job. I can't see anyone doing that, like, no matter what you do, you might say you love it, but really, you'd not rather not be there. You'd rather have a holiday or... You know of course, I mean? man, but you've got to find your passion in life, which is difficult once you start cutting out the negativity and the things that you don't. Like, we've spoke many times and we talk about drinking. You used to always support it. You used to always give me the excuses and I says, well, okay, okay, but we'll touch on... He's a judgy bastard, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, fucking right, I'm like, because... <laughs> it's like, you're, you're missing something in your life. I'm like, shut up, I just want to fucking drink. <laughs> but, um, I've lived it. I know what it's like. I masked all my pain, all my misery with drink, drugs, being the loudest prick in the room, I was the weakest. I was so fucking weak. And I don't like, I don't always, I don't preach all the time, but when I see somebody's got goodness in them and I see they're trying to do good, sometimes you just need to put those wires together for somebody to see the world differently. What was the height of your madness going through your drink and your drugs? What was the worst times when you thought, right, fuck me, man, I need to make, to make changes? Oh, just when I was to party for days on end, like, you know, just, you know what it's like, you're just in the house and, you start like it's when the light the lights go or the start to get light outside and it and it's like 
what am I doing, man? Like, and they come down and you just start to think, what the fuck am I doing? Like, you're suicidal. Like, you're literally like, you just want to make a change, but then you feel so rough that you just get back on it because you think a drink will pull me through. A drink will pull me through. Like, <laughs> it never does. It does for a bit, but then it just comes back 10 yeah, times worse, like the next day or the next week. And then you're like, you're ill for a week or two weeks, and then you do it all over again the weekend after. Was that difficult for yourself with depression and anxiety? Yeah, like especially after my mum, like, oh God, I was. I've been. I can't even talk about it. I've been suicidal quite a few times. I actually, like, was in hospital once from taking an overdose. But, yeah, like, it is really hard to, like... You do just drink, try to think you can drink through it, or it just, it does numb the pain for a bit. Like, it does give you happiness for that few hours that you're doing it. But like you said, just just comes back 10, 50 times worse once you sober up or whatever. And that's why you end up, drinking all the time because it's trying to like just feel to, normal yeah, again try to balance it out but masking it with the alcohol or drugs i did for many years so it's easy for me now to sit and sail it it's not the option and it's not the solution to everybody we're all going to battle with death we're all going to battle with disease it's just it's the way of the world as sad as it is it's just life but we're just so used to escaping from it because we don't know how to handle pain. We don't know how to handle losing that loved one. But what you've got to understand is how proud your mum will be. We're sitting in this gaff. <laughs> you've got a beautiful son. Your dad's one of the soundest guys I've ever met. You've got two dogs. You've got me as a friend. You know what? Fucking life is great. Yeah. It's I know. Your- it is on paper, isn't it? Like, you look. everyone probably looks at me Instagram. Not that I... I'm fake online because when I do my Q&As, which is a lot, I'm one million percent honest about every single thing in my life. Like, I, I tell it how it is. Like, I, I, I say all the time, it's not perfect. I don't pretend to be absolutely wedged. I've done all right for myself. I'm skint now, I bought this house. <laughs> but everyone just thinks, like, yeah, I do Lambo and stuff like that, and people think, oh, my God, she's made it. She must be so happy. She's got everything everyone ever dreams of. I said it a lot. Money doesn't make you happy. Um makes you more comfortable and like I'd rather cry in a six bedroom house than than a than a flat but like it honestly doesn't and if if the reason you're like doing things that you're doing is only because of the, mo- the money you really are doing life wrong and like I said I genuinely thought I was happy doing the stripping for years and I, I felt like I was enjoying myself um the stuff I've done online I found it a lot harder but like I said I was basically doing that for me me brand my business the money essentially um and yeah, I've done things that for money that maybe I shouldn't have, or like deep down should like. Am I happy that I've done that? No, not really. Um, but I know there is girls out there that genuinely enjoy it and love doing it and enjoy sex, so they like may as well make the content out of it. Like, but for me, it was a struggle because it's not part of like my real personality. See, when you started making some serious dough, was that more stresses and more pressures for yourself, or did you just enjoy life a bit more? I mean, I've fucking wasted a fortune. Like, I've had everything, like, materialistic-wise, everything that any person could ever want. Like, I loved handbags, so that when you get a Birkin, the most expensive handbag in the world, is, like, that's it. The ultimate goal. How much? Oh, I only paid seven 7,000 for it, which is still a oh, lot for a handbag, but there is ones that are, like, 100 grand and stuff. But, like, that brand itself is, like, the most expensive handbags in the world. But for me, I was like, oh, I'd love to get a bag, and oh, my God, I'd love to get a Range Rover. Then it was, I'd love to get a Lambo. Had it, had it, had it. I haven't got the Lambo now, got rid of that. I haven't got the Birkin now, got rid of that. I couldn't give a fuck. Like, now I'm all I'm wearing is, like, literally basic clothes and like Nike trainers and that like everything I'd be designer it does not make you happy like I put this on my Instagram the other week because all I see is young girls 18 year olds driving up like to buy Balenciaga trainers McQueen's Louis Vuitton bags honestly stop like you'll regret it one day like listen to this old cow because I have been there done that got the fucking t-shirt lost the money on it and you just have to invest your money for like more important things for your future like houses or like even cars are a fucking waste of money I mean I've still got an expensive car but I can afford that on top of my other stuff like as well I'm not gonna just go and get a van or something but like I have wasted I lost 30 grand on my Lambo like 30 grand like that just out the window um and I just I see people doing it like 
even for example, like Molly May, like the influencer, like she's like dripping in like thousands of pounds worth of like jewelry and like designer clothes. I think that outfit alone was 10, 20 grand. She's still living in a rented flat. Like what? I just want to shake them and go, this is the mistakes I made when I was younger. Like I just want to say to them, like, please just invest your money better like listen to me like because I've been there and I, now I've got like I've got four properties and stuff I'm definitely not like in a bad position but I could have 20 properties for the money I've wasted like I really could but, yeah, but you live again, and you learn exactly like that's just all I learned in covering all that stuff that you've done was to get you through the pain of everything else so those things do help like Social media is, is bullshit. It's people living a fake life. The more followers you have, I can guarantee the more depressed th they, those people will or lonely, be. lonely, yeah. Because you're constantly chasing likes, attention. It's very superficial and it's it's a dark place to get involved in. Now, I've made many changes in my life, but I know I'm addicted to my social media. Mm -hmm. Post a wee photo when you're feeling a bit down, give me some attention. Tell me how amazing my podcasts are doing. Mm -hmm. it, what does it re mean, really? It when doesn't. I took my six-week break to make my new documentary... Oh, the first day I signed into all social media platforms as soon as I signed out because I thought what if somebody died what if somebody needs me nobody fucking cares about <laughs> nobody you nobody needs you the people, because you look at people's stories and photos every day you kind of grow a fake relationship as if you really know them yeah. but once you came out of it not one of these persons not one of these people Miss contacted you. me anyway <laughs> I made sure I was alright then you come back on and people say oh where yeah. were you so it is fake yeah. but it's just where our focus goes it just seems normal it becomes part of your life mm -hmm. So getting through all that then, and then you feel pregnant, how does that become, make changes in your life? So I never, ever wanted kids. I was very, very vocal about the fact that I never wanted kids. Why is that? I was just too selfish. All I cared about was making money, partying, enjoying myself. And to be fair, I never had a relationship long enough to have kids. <laughs> but I got that to That doesn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're out there planting your seed all over Glasgow. You, you, you've got more kids than you know about you. <laughs> But I just never ever wanted them. And then I met my me, um, ex, obviously, who was my baby's dad. And it was like a proper, I fall in love quick, me. Like, I could literally fall in love in one day. Like, you're the best thing since sliced bread. I believe anything you tell me. I don't, I'm a proper, honest, open person. So I just think everyone else is like that when they're not. I believe anything you fucking tell me so you can pull the wool over my eyes. So that's why I get used and take the piss out of. Because if you tell me, like, the sky is pink, I'm going to believe you. So I met my ex and. I honestly fell in love with them straight away. I was really, really happy. And I was pregnant in three months. I said, I want to have a baby with you. Like, I'd, I was 32. No, 31. I got pregnant in... No, oh, sorry. I know I'll have been 32 when I got pregnant. No, I'm not 32. No, right. Sorry. 31. So, I got pregnant three, month, three months after we were together. And then, yeah, it was the worst pregnancy ever. Like, I hated every minute of it. Um, I was really poorly, but he was really supportive and stuff like that. Lockdown, lockdown hit. So I was pregnant at the right time, really. No one could go anywhere. Um, and yeah, I was just um, really depressed and suffering with pregnancy. I hated it. And then my baby come along. Then I literally split up with his dad eight to ten weeks after he was born. Because he was just totally not the person that I thought he was. Um, There's nothing like lockdown and someone not being at the work and bringing in more stress and a babe, newborn baby and lack of sleep. There's nothing like all them things in one go to really put the pressure on and see if it's real. And I just wanted better. I just wanted better than what I was getting. He was lazy, didn't want to do anything in the house. He was good with the baby, don't get me wrong, he's a good dad, but didn't want to do a thing in the house, didn't want to go about at work, didn't want to, because I was making money, didn't want to contribute anything financially, just wanted to live off me and I was just sick of it. And yeah, basically just kicked him out. And then that was that really. Um, Did you feel used? I, yeah, he, like I paid for his full life for a whole year. I paid off all his debts. He literally couldn't work. He's a barber, so he couldn't work for a whole year for COVID. He lived at my house for free. I paid his car payments. I paid his, he had credit cards and loans. Racked it up to about 30 grand, the debt. And now he hasn't given me a single penny back. And he hasn't given me a single penny for the, me baby. Well, he gave me 20 quid about... When we've been split up a week, he gave me 20 quid and he hasn't given me a penny since. And we've been split up about four months now. But you know what? He has the baby two days a week. So, and he's a good dad. I'm just going to, I just got to get on with it really. Like, he's, it's not right, but is where it is. People go, well, she doesn't need it. That's not the point because he's so bad with money. He'll have not nothing to give the baby in his future. Whereas the money he gave me, I would have invested it maybe into another rental for the baby for his future and 
I'm just really be- miles better with my money now. I wouldn't dream of spending a thousand pound on a handbag now because everything I've got is for my son, for his future. And that's all I think about now is everything's for him. Whereas his dad's really selfish and only, like, if he has money, he just thinks, what can I buy for myself? Like, do you know what I mean? Whereas I just don't feel like that anymore. But when he's, my son's old, he'll, he'll realise and he'll say, look where I've got you and his dad will still be living at his mum's house at age. And it mad though how kids make you see the world differently. And how does it go with Chelsea Ferguson of old to now when your son gets older as well? How does that play a, a pet a effect on your mind of the videos that's out there, the pictures and stuff? Well, people say this all the time, but I can literally get any videos or pictures removed off the internet. Like any, because I can do a DCMA takedown. Um, so they basically, you basically email the website and they don't have rights to keep them on there. So once I take them all off, I know there is a chance that someone could have them on their phone for the future, but they would literally just be doing that out of sheer jealousy to show anything like that. My son, he'll know exactly where my money's come from when he's old enough, I'll tell him. And I know he'll still be proud of me because he'll have lived a good life. He'll have a mum who loves him. He's got loads of people around him that love him. Like I said before, getting your tits out on the internet doesn't make you a bad person. Like, it really doesn't. And, you know, I think the the... The more we go into, like, these industries are getting more and more popular, the more women are realising, I don't need to put up with this dickhead who, who's looking after me financially. I can go and make my own money. And they and people are realising that there is... Men are only angry about it because we're making money off something that we used to give away for free. Like, that's really the, the real reason that men are, so, men are so mad about women doing this kind of thing. I get a lot of... I get more shit from men nowadays than I do women. I get shit from men, like... Oh, like especially when I got that Lambo, it's actually any man's dream car, map black Lambo, like who wouldn't want one? So I got a lot of shift for that. Um, men saying like, I fucking graph for 80 hours a week and I can't find it for Lambo. And I really do feel for them. Like, yeah, you do graft all week, and, but don't hate the player, hate the game. You guys created this kind of industry. You the one to put us, you're sexual- the one funding it. Yeah, you are the ones who are obviously paying for it. Or you sexualising us. You are the nobody ever whinges about going on Pornhub or Red Tube or whatever for free. They don't whinge about that. They only whinge when they start are off to pay for it. I'm not fucking giving that slag twenty quid, but they'll go on Pornhub for a free wank. How am I a slag for making money? But they're nor a slag or you're not a bad person for it. Don't like point your finger with one hand and wank with the other. Basically, is what I'm trying <laughs> to say. How um, does that? Does people ever stop you in the street and tell you, I've watched your videos, I've watched your senior... Well, nah, nah, like, obviously, I'm from creepy? a small town where everyone, everyone knows everyone. So, yeah, like, people who I've known all my life, like, you know, one of my friends i seen the other month, I hadn't seen him for a while, and he was like, oh, yeah, I've signed up. Even my mate who I used to live with, he's a footballer, I used to, I used to live with him, and he, like, he goes to me, oh, yeah, I signed up, you were thinking that. And I was like, oh, my God. But loads of people do for, like, a laugh, like, oh, we know, it. let's have a look. Like, it's just pure nosiness, isn't it? Like... I know girls who've signed up with my thing, like, out of nosiness or, like, you know, just to go... Just to, even if they're there to fucking slag me off or laugh at me, they're still paying to see it, like, and it doesn't bother me at all as long as, I, like, they're paying, basically. But people are always going to talk about you. People are, Like, if I still worked in McDonald's now, I think people wouldn't slag me off. Oh, my God, she's still working in McDonald's after all these years, would you dare? But they slag me off because I've done something different. Like, they're only happy if you live in a playing bar and normal life working a nine to five like no one slags you off then are you working at office no one cares like because I'm doing something different thinking outside the box that's when the people start you're always going to get slagged off when you do something different and I was the original person the first person to do it and that's why I was so popular and that's why like the industry like started to become an industry because I not that I'm saying I invented it (laughs) I invented the industry but like I was one of the first people I knew to do it. So then it started to become a thing. Because people were like, oh, we can make some money out of this. Like, How do you think it is so popular? Because men are always going to like nudes and sex. And women are always going to like money. And once they realise they can make money out of men finding them attractive, then, like the people who pay mainly for this kind of thing... Is people that know yeah. So you'll probably say the girl you've known all your life and you've always went in Starbucks and she works and then you go, I don't know what tits look like. Like men do, like I think like that because I'm bisexual. So I go, I don't know what she looks like naked. So then if there was suddenly a page where you could pay a tenner to see her naked, 
you're going to pay it. Like, so I think that's where your customers come from. It's people who have seen you out and about in real life or they live in your street or they've always fantasised about you as that girl who lives down the street. Now you can see her naked. So that's where, like, the, the, the demand comes from. She's not a porn star. She's a girl next door or the girl in Starbucks or the girl in McDonald's who you've always known and thought was quite attractive. Now you can see her naked. That's where... It Men are easy manipulated, aren't they? You're soft as think, shit. Think with the cocks, These are soft they? as shit. You think with your cocks at the end of the day, <laughs> and it's always going to be a thing because men are always going to think with their cocks. So, like, if there was a chance, like, say, for, if Michelle Keegan started, I'd be fucking straight on their pain. Like, you know, someone who always fancied or admired in the public eye or who finally started selling nudes, of course you would. Like, remember when everyone started doing that, them leaks years ago? It's on Twitter and stuff, like, so and so's phones being hacked, their eye count and all their leaks. Like the most popular thing, most trending, so and so's leaks. Like it was ham, but it was Jennifer out of Hunger Games and all that air, like stuff got leaked. Men are fucking animals, like some women as well. But men, as soon as you you can see their tits straight on the internet, find their tits like, you know what I mean? Even if it was against their, their consent that they got leaked. So you may as well make some money out of it because she made nothing and everyone's seen her tits anyway. You look at Kim Kardashian. That's how that. That's, that's what I'm saying. The gals that ever slag us off for doing what we do. Idolise Kim and the family. Everyone sort of forgot where she come from. Do you can still find her porno on there. Yeah. You really think that was an accident that that got leaked? Ray J didn't have a fucking clue. And now he's nowhere to be seen while she's literally one of the most popular people in the whole world. All from a porno. So when people slag me off or like other girls that do this and she, I wouldn't dare do that. And you idolise Kim and her family. The, the have sex sells at the end of the day, it's always going to be the, the most... Like remember when Talisa's sex tape got leaked of that... Awful blow job she did. <laughs> she won FHM Sexiest Woman the next year. Something like that. Like, you know, it's all, you put her on the map. She wouldn't have even got an X Factor if it wasn't for that porno. I guarantee it. Like, you know, these things step you up somewhere along the line. And then you get like a... a you don't believe the amount of... Like, there's people in the industry, like actors and... I'm not going to say names, but uh, that I've heard of who've slept their way to like to get in films and things like that. And you just... You don't know how much of it goes on, but... Sex makes the world go around as much as money. Like, it's literally the be all end all, isn't it? So, how are you feeling now? What, in general? Or... Yeah. All right, I suppose. Like, because you made a big announcement a couple of days ago, you're not going to have a drink for 30 days. Yep. You were doing well anyway. Obviously, you've got Hendrix now. You're making adjustments. Yeah, I don't ever drink. I, yeah. I don't ever get drunk when I've got my son, like, ever. I, I'm not an alcoholic by arm as you think I am. I like a drink and there's been times when I've definitely, I have got a problem with alcohol, but I definitely don't drink every single day. And I, when I do drink, I can't have one or two and go to bed. Like I'm not the type of person who has, can't have one and doesn't stop because that's not true. Like before I made this announcement about the 30 days, like the day before that, I literally had one Prosecco. The day before that, I literally had two Proseccos. But in general, I know that I have got a problem as in my son goes away at the weekend and I get absolutely mortal for two or three days. Then I'm rough all week and it's not fair uh, on on my son to be like hung over for the week, like and just tired and lethargic and not getting stuff done. Um, but yeah, so that's why I've decided to just have 30, 30 days off and I'm going to document how I feel for 30 days. Um, see see much, how much more I get done. How it, It'll be the weekends a challenge. Like it hasn't bothered me so far. Um, I mean, I'm only on day two, but <laughs> <laughs> didn't bother me. But it's it's just seeing what I can achieve without it. And I know you're always in me. And to be honest, everyone listening, when I first met James, I thought, oh God, he's a bit of a prick. Him. He's, trying to, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to tell me not to drink and I can't be told not what not to do. It has to be my decision. No one can tell me what I can and can't do. And it makes me want to do it like, even more if you tell me I can't drink. So James come down the first time and I was like, he's a fucking prick him, I'm getting drunk. Because he cause he told me I shouldn't, so I did. But then obviously the more I thought about them, I thought, you know what, everything he says, he is right, but I am just that rebel and you, to, teenage girl inside that says, fuck what anyone else says. But now I've decided off my own back, you will be a better person if you have 30 days off the drink. Like, it's not about being an alcoholic or not being able to live without alcohol, it really isn't. I've just got myself in a habit of, I'll go out for dinner, I'll have a Prosecco, I'll go out for dinner, I'll have a Blue Wicked. Or, like, it's just easily done when you don't have a job um, to just do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. So, yeah, I just decided, I've 30 days off and document how I feel and then hopefully get in a better relationship with alcohol to go, right, look, you can get pissed once a week or, you know, and just 
promise myself that I'm going to do that and see how much better I feel rather than going, right, the baby's gone, my dad's, and then his dad's, so I'll have Friday, Saturday, Sunday on the piss. Like, that's no good. You need to, like, have some kind of good balance. I know you you think I shouldn't have any at all. No, I don't think that. It's just alcohols are depressant. People are sociably acceptable. And I, I want to speak for the people who's underweight, overweight, who's millionaire, who's got nothing, who's strong as fuck, who's mentally tough, who's just people from all walks of life, every colour, every religion to understand that life can be beautiful. It is tough at times, but alcohol is a depressant, no matter what way you look at it. Now, whether it's one drink a night or one drink a week, people finish work and they want to go and have a bottle of wine and to make them feel relaxed, but you ain't going to relax by destroying your, your body and destroying your mindset, feeling confused the next day and you can do some meditation, you can go a nice walk, you can go to the gym. So many people are struggling and battling, but we escape from the external stuff, the fucking under-eating, the over-eating, the alcohol, the drugs. It's so important. That I don't want to be one of these guys who are preaching, like I say, oh, fuck off, you prick, but I see so much goodness in you and, and, and I also see when people who's battling and who's not, and we're all battling, I cover my battles well now because I'm not doing the daft shit when I'm full of drink and full yeah. of drugs, but everybody has got greatness in them. Everybody can make changes. Now, whether if you're a plumber, a stripper, a porn star, a footballer, it doesn't matter who you are, we're still battling at some degree. Now, by all means, Everything in moderation, but what is moderation? People think moderation is maybe once every few days or once a week. It's not really moderation because it's not giving your body time to adjust. Same as coffee addictions or gambling or whatever it is you're doing. If you're overindulging in it, then it becomes you and then it steals your energy because anything that you're taking that is, is raising you up, coffee as well. Bringing you back down. Yeah, it's going to crash bang, you back yeah. down and it's okay to feel sad, it's okay to feel down, it's normal in life because we've got so many distractions now, we've got so much pressures, we're trying to keep up with everybody else, we're trying to live, see if we're looking good enough, have we got this, are we looking pretty, are we, we're just so much pressures from all walks of fucking life, but making some adjustments and making that adjustment, like you, like I've told you, write down a journal, write down everything that you've done and what you've achieved within that 30 days. Not only will you grow a better relationship with yourself, but you'll grow a stronger relationship with your kid. Now, it scares me that I used to get mad with it for three and four days and then pick up my son or my daughter and then how can they get the best version of me? No, no. You're an absolute fucking waster. Like, yeah. I was just wasting away. Yeah, I would get a photo, post it on social media and pretend that it was a good dad. I mm. mean, a fucking good dad. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm still trying to build relationships and bonds with my kids now. And I'm, I'm a working process. I am a man. I do make mistakes, the same as yourself. But if you're, if you're a mother or a father and you're willing to get mad with it at the weekend and then get your son, for me that's some sort of sense of a, an abuse mm. as well, because you're going there, head's all messed, if you take a line of gear, your dopamine levels don't come back down to a normal state for three to six months later, mm -hmm. so people think they're fine after five days, they're not, they'll still crash next week, so we don't give ourselves and our bodies enough time to adjust yeah. to good things, and doing this 30 days, I guarantee you will be like, ah, do you know what, you big prick, Thank you. I, I, I told you so. <laughs> How is it now, but making, when you start seeing things differently, um, for having that not give a fuck mentality to then having a son, having more responsibilities and look, your son's all, all you, he's got basically, not all he's got, but you've got your dad, but you know what I mean? Yeah. But, well, it's just like, even just like before I had my son, I used to go from relationship, relationship, like I couldn't be on my own and I would just go with like, I would just have a boyfriend who would be like, no good for me and I knew deep down they're not going to last I'll just have him until the next one comes along and that was such an awful men <laughs> my dog's looking through the window um, such an awful me mentality to have and think I'd rather be with this person even though he's wrong than be on my own and I'm totally not like that now like obviously I've got my baby and he's my number one priority and I will not settle for anything like I'm not looking for anybody um, but I will not settle for less than what we deserve basically so and I also like literally get with someone and move them in my house straight away. Like that would never ever happen again because obviously this is mine and my son's house and it's just a completely different scenario now. Like I just, I just have, it's just everything's different. Like everything, every penny I make, it's not for, it's not for me, it's for him. And I just know that he's going to have ev like everything when he's older, like as in just a good life, but he'll also be raised with like respect and kindness because his dad's like, spoil and they went to private school and stuff but his mum and dad didn't give him the um the tools to survive outside of their home like he was 
he couldn't, he couldn't do anything in the house or wouldn't do anything in the house because he's so used to having his ass wiped, which is not how my son's going to turn out. Like, I'm, he's going to be entitled like he was entitled. He thought he deserved the money or he deserved to not work. Why should I? Why, why should I do His mum actually told him not to wash up for me. Like, don't you be washing up for her. Hang on a minute. He lives in my house, doesn't pay a penny towards it. And they're our pots from us eating, but he, you don't want him to wash up. That type of mentality is not what my son's going to turn out like. He's going to do jobs from... As soon as he's old enough, I'm going to stay. do this for your pocket money. He's not going to be spoiled brat who just expects everything. Yeah, he'll have things for his future, like houses and stuff, but he has to work as well. I didn't get nothing handed on a plate. So why the hell should anybody else like it just doesn't work like that and I wouldn't want him to be like some little spoiled brat who goes my mum's gonna just get me this up here for this it doesn't work like that unfortunately how was it moving into this gaff it's been stressful because it's the first time I've had a mortgage like I have another three properties that I owned outright so it has been I think that's the reason like my head's been all over a bit because I finally I've got like a big mortgage on this so it was like put myself but like that's what normal people do like my cousin was a bit like oh, are you sure you want to do this like you're living without a mortgage like it's a really good position to be in I was like I know but most people just have mortgages like what's wrong with going to the next step and having the house of my dreams just because I have to go in a bit of a, a debt for it like I don't have debt for like other things like you know credit cards or all like that like I've been really good and sensible and bought houses and stuff now I rent me other two houses or I've got two I own three others but one's our office that I own and then the other two I rent out as houses but they were both houses that I lived in. Uh, so the first one I lived in and then I just bought the second one that I lived in and now this one. Um, but yeah, it's like literally couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better house. Obviously I need to do it inside. Like people watching this, I did not pick this olive wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> everything needs to be decorated, but the house itself and the plot and the grounds, everything I've ever dreamed of and ever wanted. Um, so yeah, I'm like over the moon really. It's like, but like, you know, like you said, you you go through life going, right, I'll be happy when I get this. I'll be happy when I get that. I'll be happy when I get a Birkin. I'll be happy when I get a Lambo. I'll be happy when I get a big six bedroom house. You don't just move in and all of a sudden you, your problems go away and you're totally happy. It doesn't work like that. You have to work on yourself like in other ways. And I've started like therapy and stuff like that to try and like deal with me shit over the last six, six years. And that's like really important is like just getting my mind right and that's why I need to stay off the alcohol because obviously like you said it's a depressant I'm up and down it's just I just need to do better you're doing better I but want, yeah. so I'm proud of you like taking these steps is massive like, it's easy I interview gangsters is, and it's easy to so kill someone you're a gangster yeah you're a gangster <laughs> man but it's easy to kill someone it's easy to pull the trigger it's easy to fucking rob a bank it's easy to do bad shit what it ain't easy to do is fucking raise legit money and take your mum out the fucking hood. Take your mum out and give her a better life. Take your dad out, give him a better life. That's the hard part. The hard part is Go not legit. doing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not doing with what everybody else is doing. The hard part is you get more problems going legit. I've had more problems the last few years than I was when Trying I was active. Trying to get active. a mortgage yeah. and stuff with your legit, legit money. Like they want to know the inside of a fart. Like they literally yeah. want to know everything where mm -hmm. everything's come from and. Yeah, you literally do get um, you do get penalised, especially in the sex industry as well. Like I think because things they need to realise that the world's changing and online money is like even when you're doing your insurance, there's no like there's no click box, you know, when you have to put what your job is. Like there's no thingy like job for us, like you know. And it's like where the world's changing now. There's like influence and things like that is like billion pound industry like there's so much money to be made online now with YouTube and Instagram and you know podcasts and porn and whatnot and they need to realize that the world's changing and we have we i'm paying fucking six figures in tax like legit and like it's a joke how much companies don't so i couldn't get an english bank account like business bank account they wouldn't have me money because it was dirty money but it was like i'm paying six figures in tax more tax than places like starbucks and that but i'm the le illegitimate person that you don't want in your bank or oh, my dirty money's no good when i'm paying the tax on it but then there's like all these other scams are going on where like other people are like getting away with it and I just it really annoys me that we're tarred with the brush that like we're not good enough to like have our money in their banks and you know what I mean like you just really do get like treated differently and stuff like that yeah. how was it going speaking to a psychologist for the first time oh god oh, I'm feeling like the baby crying um it was really hard um I've got, she said, you don't even know where to start. Like you're jumping from this problem to that problem to that problem. I've got like probably six years, maybe it's longer bottled up in there. Um, and it's just trying to like decide which one to talk about first really. But I came away really like 
drained and like to be honest I was supposed to go back and I haven't been back yet I need to go back that's part of my 30 day challenge to get back to my therapy but it's just it's just really awful like drag everything up again do you know what I mean but you can't always hide from it hide from it <laughs> place it in a wee box and shove it down because that, that a box eventually opens up in the most unexpected times now to heal you must face every problem you've ever came across that you thought I don't want to I don't want to face it, so I'll put it away. It always comes to a head, but the amazing thing is that you're doing it, you're putting the work out. What happens is, man, you, you then be the light for other people who's now battling. There's so many people, listen, I fucking repeat myself constantly, we're all battling. So many people watch these programmes and watch these shows that are different opinions, different personalities. Everybody struggles. As no matter who you are, we all struggle. You've got the big gaff, you're doing well for yourself. No matter if you're a billionaire, millionaire, entrepreneur, porn star, joiner, footballer, politician, will battle. I can sit at some at anybody in a table, no matter their background, and we can fucking lay it all on the line. So it just goes to show that no matter who you are, we struggle. But I, I honestly am proud of you for making those adjustments and changes. When are you going to go back and see this woman again? I'm going to text her today. I'll try and get booked in for like mm. next week. But I think the, like, the thief of joy is everybody comparing on Instagram. The bodies on Instagram aren't real. The lives on Instagram aren't real. The money on Instagram certainly isn't real. You're literally envying some... Envying, is that a real, real word? You're envious of something that doesn't exist. Like, people obviously look at my life and think it's perfect and stuff, and yes, I have got the houses and the cars and nice bags or whatever, but you need to stop thinking that that's going to make you happy because chasing them things really doesn't, like, make you happy. I've said this probably already, but... I just want to, if anyone who's younger than me who's listening to this or anyone who thinks, oh, I really want her life. Or, you don't, like, you. your life can be, like, probably as happier than mine in a, in a way. Some people will have a happier life than me. You just need to find the happiness in the, in the normal things in life, like me going for walks with my dogs and my baby and, you know, just eating nice food. And that's where, like, your happiness comes when you're just happy doing these basic things that don't don't particularly cost anything could even be free like the best things in life are free walk going for walks in the sun laying in the like i don't know just like one people to realize that like no don't be losing yourself chasing something that just, it ultimately doesn't make you happy in the long run where does chelsea ferguson go from here i just want to like be a better mom a better friend a better person better person to myself like find happiness like within me and like what we me and him both deserve. Like if I meet somebody in the future, like uh, my goal actually would be be able to like be confident, sober, like you know meet somebody sober and like actually you know feel confident enough have sex sober. <laughs> 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 you know just like be like a just be more comfortable, confident myself. I think people just over the years dragged all my confidence out of me. Like when I was eighteen young spring chicken I thought I was stunning like literally like no lips no teeth like like that and I thought I was gorgeous like I really did and then the older I got and the more people who knew who I was they knocked and knocked the confidence out of me she's ugly she's minging like ood fan fancy air she's a dog like there's just all these horrible tweets about me and I slowly but surely believed them until I started getting all the surgery and like the lip fillers and the teeth and the Botox and the tits and the lipo and like the nose job. I've literally had it all because people, oh, they sag me off. And I know even probably when people say this now, I'm probably going to get some comments, but like, it's so hard to like accept who you are when everybody's telling you that you, that you will glean stuff like that. So I don't know. It's just, I just want to like be happy in who I am and not care about what other people say. But you're doing the right steps to then do that. Like all the surgery, all the bullshit again is another mask. Now, I know people, it is another master, and awful will wear off that shit after a couple of days. But once you start growing confidence in yourself, the reason why you do that is by fucking exercising, going for a nice walk, staying away from the toxic things, the toxic friends, the toxic family members, yeah. staying away from the drink, the drugs, because that fucks with your central nervous system. Yeah. Now, that's just facts, man. Like, it, it really fucks with your mindset, and now we do those things because it gives us the confidence as if we don't care. But let's fucking start. Listen, if people can let me in their rooms on a Monday and a Tuesday to film them after I come down, instead of the photos on a Sunday and a Saturday and Sunday night, and they're all on fucking Instagram, loving life, all chipping in for a bottle of vodka to sit in a booth and pretend that they're big balling. I think we need to tell everybody that you actually came down to do this podcast a few weeks ago and I was pissed, so he said he wouldn't do it. So I thought that I'd actually 
pissed you off and I was like I think I rang you like the next day after and I see if you were still speaking to me because I thought you were pissed off for me but um yeah, like I just really apologise for that because yeah, you don't need to it was unprofessional. But I've never had to be professional in my life, so it's hard for me to like try and get a grip on like real reality of like, right, you're a mum now. You shouldn't be getting pissed. You should be sticking to deadlines. You should be not letting people down when they've got busy schedules. And this is not on really. And I appreciate that you came back. <laughs> yeah, I always would, man. Like I says, I'm not a, I'm not ready to fuck anybody over. Every guest that comes on my show. It's just a natural chat. Like, there's no, there's no big notes here. There's no. We're just yeah. talking. Like, I wouldn't have anybody on the show drunk. I would never want to embarrass anybody. That's not my intention. Because people will be watching, thinking if you're drunk, thinking what a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. No, I know you're a good person. I've spoke to you sober, <laughs> not many times, but I have. And um, people get a different opinion of you after today, and you'll see that. Wait a minute, man. She's sound as fuck. Like, this is what it's all about. It's just to show people. I can make people present their best self to me without any bullshit, without trying to fuck anybody over. The reason why I can get the calibre of guests I can get is because my, my name is very high out there. Like, I don't fuck people over. Like, people can say what they want, they can judge, they can have their opinion of me. I know I'm solid. I know my side of the road's clean. I know mm. my soul is pure. I still make mistakes. I still fuck about. I'm still daft. I'm still a cheeky bastard. But I am human. Judgy cunt. I'm a judgy bastard. <laughs> Maybe not say it to your face, but I've got a lot to say about people's backs. You say it in my face. Yeah, but I think that's the best though. Plant the seeds. You are better. Like, I'm not a guy who's going to come in and get everybody. Like, I was very good at getting people drunk as well and getting awesome. everybody mad. About, Why are you fucking leaving and that? You like, locked doors. Nobody's getting out. I want to party for three days. When people are leaving, I get upset. Yeah. But it's just to give people to see the world a bit differently. You don't need to hide from your pain. The reason like, I'm not learning from books, I'm talking from experience. Now, I've lived some shit. I've done a lot of shit. And I'm making the changes to then become a better individual. It is difficult. I still battle. But you've now got to understand how far you've come. You're still young. You're making mass changes now, which is a beautiful thing. You've got the experience to live from it. It's only going to, it's, it's only going to make your life better. One million percent. You start seeing things differently and your confidence grows. And then people start treating you better. You're going, why does he treat me better? It's because you're attracting better. Yeah. You're still going to get assholes coming in your life. People still try and test me. But my life's going to too good to retaliate as much as i'd love to sometimes like people say leopards can't change their spots that's not true but it don't change all the spots i've still got that killer instinct i will always fucking fight my case but life can be a beautiful thing we don't need to retaliate yeah we don't need to feed the energy into other people that like, my life's going too good man i'm interviewing amazing people i'm sitting in fucking big gaffs do you know what i mean i still can't get an iron though from my fucking <laughs> shirt but life is good <laughs> For anybody that's maybe battling Chelsea, that's maybe going through a bit of depression, that's maybe masking their shit with alcohol or whatever, what advice would you give for them? I mean, I can't really preach about the alcohol because it's been like my second day. <laughs> but I just think I have been the lowest of low. I've been really low even when I've had loads of money. I've been really happy when I've had nothing. Like, I think I was one of the happiest days of my life when I worked at McDonald's. Like when you've got, you know, hardly any responsibilities and stuff like that. But if people are listening who are suicidal, I know people always say, go and talk to someone, but it's just not as easy as that. And when I, the day I tried to kill myself and was in hospital, I'd actually been on a night out and had the best night. Like, and then I still went home and did that. Like, so I feel like it's, it's not, it's hard to like see the signs if anything like and stuff like that. When people say, oh, why well, didn't my friend tell me stuff like that? They didn't tell you because they didn't want to. And it's hard to like, it's hard to open up sometimes, but I just want you to know that it does one million percent always get better and you do always come out the other side. It might take a while, but you do come out the other side and it, it is still hard. And I've obviously still got my demons, like I'm battling tears back all the time. But like you you do get happy again. Like you, life goes on. So don't make like a stupid decision to like end your life when you will be happy again, basically. What do you think about that night when you try to kill yourself? I just think, I don't know, obviously I, there was nothing even really dramatic that had happened. Like it was just a proper like build up of random things. And yeah, I was just, I was only about 18 at the time. Was that a cry out for help or was that 100% you wanted to go? I don't know. Maybe, maybe now looking back, cry for help. But I was in hospital for like four or five days and... It was just awful putting my family through that and stuff. But that was like one of the turning points of my life to get me 
to where I am now because I was I'd finished college and I was just in working in a pub and it was just like I just felt that my life was a dead end like I mean at 18 come on like your life full life's ahead of you and I just wanted to like at that point I just thought there was nothing to live for which is silly um but after I tried to kill myself my best friend Jackie lived he moved down to Sheffield to go to uni there so I went, I'm going to come visit you. And I went to there and it was so random. There was like this place with all these waterfalls. Like, I can't remember the name of it. It's in the city centre of Sheffield. And I was just sat there and I looked around. I was like, life is beautiful. Like, what am I doing? So that's when I decided, right, I'm going to apply to uni and I'm going to come move down here. And I don't think I would have done that if I hadn't tried to kill myself. So I'm like glad in a way that I did do that because it was like a turning point for me to like make a change. So then I moved to Sheffield and then obviously that's when I started dancing and my whole life changed. So, like, something, it took something as drastic as that to get me down there. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes it does, though. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to go through the darkness to find your light. You now, do. We never know what's round the corner. I can preach all this shit and say, this is a great life, man. I could be fucking... You'd be stand- on the Jaegers come, yeah, come, come, come five o'clock. Yeah, I could be standing in fucking top of a bridge tomorrow <laughs> with a bottle of Jack Daniels. You don't know, but it's trying to enjoy the present moment. Sometimes... Don't try and concentrate on the finishing line and set, constantly search, constantly search for more followers or more money or all the fucking bullshit that comes with and try to enjoy the present moment, which I know you're trying to read the power of now as well. Yeah. Which are, listen, for coming on today and telling your story, because I know how emotional you do get, but you are phenomenal, you are beautiful. You wouldn't say intelligent, but you've got a business fucking <laughs> mindset where you're absolutely caning it. Now, making those adjustments in your life, people are going to start seeing a different Chelsea Ferguson. Yeah. You're going to fucking own it. But for your mum will be proud everything that you've done, everything that you're achieving and the changes that you're making now. I'm proud of you. You've got a friend for life and I love you. Keep strong and I look forward to seeing the rest of your future. Babe. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.